animal behavior. We were just talking about domestic animals and various behaviors um, like fetch. Dogs love to fetch things. Um, tug of war. Dogs love a tug of war. And animals that are domestic have been bred to be the way they are by artificial selection. So we, we select animals that have the traits that we as humans desire. And then we, we breed them. The traits that the, the animals portray, the behavioral traits, many are genetically determined and many are learned and some are both. And so you might wonder what would happen if you, if you had two different species that had a different, different behavior um, for a certain thing like predation or something. And then you, you bred them and got a hybrid. So a hybrid is the offspring of two different species. What kind of behavior would the hybrid have? Would it have a combination of both types of behavior from the different species? Uh, or would one overrule the other one? So that's a big question. I don't know if there's uh, exactly an answer for that, but um, it's an interesting question. Okay, so animal behavior. Behavior is what an animal does and how it does it. It's a very broad field. Learning is a behavioral process. That's what you're doing right now. It's a behavior. Um, the, the study of animal behavior is called ethology ethology. These are some pioneers in ethology. And this one in particular, his name is Conrad Lorenz. And he studied imprinting, a kind of behavior that uh, animals show very early on in embryonic development, not embryonic development, in, in um, infancy, so when they're very small. Some they have to be able to witness something particular in order to exhibit a behavior. And so my question to you is, is that the same with humans? Do human babies have a limited time to learn certain things? That's a big question. Sometimes we can study other animals' behaviors to get a better idea of human behavior. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some um, researchers that delved into human behavior with mixed uh, results. So questions about behavior in behavioral ecology or ethology um, can be broad or, or narrower. So more like a reductionist approach or a broader evolutionary approach, approach. So the names given to those kinds of behavior are approximate and ultimate. So those are the causes, or we might be looking not just at causes, but also mechanisms. The immediate stimulus would be approximate cause. The contribution to survival and reproduction would be an ultimate cause of behavior. So proximate Questions are more like your how questions. How does this behavior work? What triggers the animal to do it? Um, is it the time of day? Uh, how many hours there are in the day that trigger mating behavior, for example? Um, is it the smell of a certain prey that triggers the predatory behavior? Um, that, and then that comes to territorial behavior. Well, a lot of animals mark their territory. So what, what triggers animals to do that? What is the signal? 
for how does it work? Anatomical mechanisms underlie behavioral acts. An ultimate question would be more like, why do they do it? Um, how does that behavior address the evolutionary significance? How does it contribute to survival? And in particular, reproduction. Because just like all other traits, the reason they exist is because they contribute to survival, to reproductive age. Not all behaviors. I mean, some behaviors are superfluous. But the behaviors that help to, um, that help an, orga an organism to survive and reach reproductive age, those are the ones that will be passed on to the next generation. So ethology is the scientific study of animal behavior, particularly in natural environments. You know, when I, when I was looking for videos to show about animal behavior, I was looking online, I actually found quite a lot about domestic animals um, and animal husbandry. So people are interested in the behavior of uh, cattle and the behavior of dogs and, and the behavior of sheep. Um, but, but we'll concentrate more on, on natural environments and, and wild animals. So behavioral ecology extends the observations of animal behavior by studying how it's controlled, how it develops, how it evolves, and how it contributes to survival and reproductive success. Have humans ever studied human behavior? <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. We do it all the time, right? When, when, I mean, human behavior is what makes us watch television shows. We're very interested in human behavior. But we don't always look at it and think to ourselves, how is that behavior, uh, um, how does it contribute to the fitness of the individual for survival to reproduction? That's not really the thing that pops into your head from time to time. But there was a field that popped up some time ago. I think it might have been in the 60s or maybe the 70s. Um, E.O. Wilson. I don't know if you've heard of E.O. Wilson. He is a researcher, writer. Uh, I saw him once at Harvard. And he, it was interesting because when I saw him speak, he was speaking to students about the future of science and what fields would be really great to go into. And one of them was the, um, the co-evolution of genes and culture. So he was interested in culture. But sociobiology is about human behavior. Uh, it results um, of the inter from the interactions between our genes and our environment. So the problem was at that time when E.O. Wilson came up with the book Sociobiology was he explained some human behaviors on the grounds of their contribution to survival and fitness to reproduction. And that applied to some uh, sociopathic kinds of behaviors that one sees, um, abuse and those kinds of things. So, so it got a very negative reception from the general public because people thought it was portrayed as an excuse for behavior, which of course was not the intention at all. It was just an evolutionary explanation for, for some behaviors. So, um, so it kind of went underground, the sociobiology, but it reemerged as um, evolutionary psychology. And, and it's an interesting field. There is a book that I read a long time ago called The Moral Animal, which is very interesting. Very interesting look at human behavior. But uh, we'll look at animal behavior. So the basic concepts are that um, some animals will exhibit innate behaviors, some animals will exhibit learned behaviors. This type of behavior that, that was looked at by Lorenz and Tinbergen was egg rolling in a goose. 
the gray lag goose. What happened was if the egg rolled away, the female continued the motion. So once started, a behavior must be completed in a specific way, and that's a genetic trait. And it's also known as a stereotypical behavior. A fixed action pattern is a sequence of unlearned innate behaviors, and it is unchangeable, like the stereotypical behavior. Once initiated, it's continued to completion. Behaviors, whether they're genetic or learned, are usually triggered by something in the environment, the surrounding environment. That will be some kind of assigned stimulus. In the case of the gray lag goose, the stimulus is the egg rolling away. And that triggers the goose to go after the egg and roll it back into the nest. Another good example of fixed action patterns is the stickleback. So um, I was at the UBC Botanical Gardens. There's a pond there that has three spine sticklebacks. And um, it, it turns out the three spine stickleback is quite famous <laughs> here in British Columbia, interestingly. It, it is the Galapagos finch of British Columbia. So there's a researcher out at UBC, his name is Dolph Schluter. He does, he studies evolutionary ecology, a uh, very interesting person. And he came to BC specifically to study the stickleback. And we'll look at it more closely when we look at evolution. So this, this is a male stickleback. It, this, there's a sign stimulus that causes a stickleback to become aggressive toward intruders. And it's the red color, the underside of another male that's coming into the territory. So this stickleback is uh, defending territory. It's defending territory um, around, in this case, around a nest and female. So how does an ethologist work out what the stimulus is? What would you do? How could you figure out what the stimulus is? Think about that for a moment. I uh, would like you to start thinking about experiments and experimental design, even in just a small way uh, to start, because you'll be designing some experiments yourself. Uh, you mean if the animal is already exposed to different stimuli and you want to understand which one is affecting the behavior? Or you mean if yeah. you have the animal and you have to introduce the stimuli that will provoke the behavior, like a response? Yeah, well, an animal is subject to many different kinds of stimuli at the same time. If you had a male fish coming into this territory of the stickleback, what is it about the fish? Is it the size of the fish? Is it the color? Uh, is it the shape? Um, is it something about the intruder's behavior? What is the stimulus? So that's a very good point. You could have all of them happening at the same time. You don't know what the specific stimulus is. You would have to do an experiment, as you said, maybe presenting each stimulus individually somehow. Is that what you were getting at? Yeah, I was, uh, I was asking if, yeah. if the question was related to understanding which stimulus is affecting the behavior of the animal yes. just by observing or by us introducing um, some stimuli to see which one right. the animal responds to? Well, that's a very good question. And for observation, um, Strict observation, I'm not sure you would be able to 
identify the specific stimulus if they're occurring at the same time. You might not be able to tell what is it about that intruding fish. Maybe if you observed over a long period of time, that could be. If perhaps a lot of different kinds of fish swam into the territory or a lot of different colored fish swam, swam into the territory, then perhaps you could, yeah. But I think an observation study like that might take quite a long time of observing many stimuli. Yeah, that's a very good point. So there is a way that uh, this was studied with this particular stickleback. So they presented these models, unrealistic looking models uh, with some red present. Yeah, so they presented different shapes, you know, uh, smaller, larger ones. But no attack occurred uh, with a realistic model that did not have red. This is an accurate model without red. So that's a, that's a pretty good experiment. The behavior needs to be, if you want to do an experiment like this, needs to be defined. In this case, the behavior is a male stickleback attacking other male sticklebacks. So what is the proximate cause? We just found that by the experiment that was done, the red belly of an intruder. That's the stimulus. So that triggers the male stickleback. The ultimate cause, uh, by chasing away the other male sticklebacks, the male uh, uh, decreases the chance that eggs in his territory will be fertilized by another male. So that, that's a long-term kind of result for this kind of behavior. But the reason that the behavior persists is because the male's own fertilized eggs survive with the genes for that particular behavior. So that behavior is propagated down generations. Um, here's another study, robins. Uh, male English robins attack a bundle of red feathers, uh, but ignore a stuffed juvenile that doesn't have any red. So one interesting point about red, um, there are costs involved with attack behavior. So if you get like really into behavioral ecology, there's lots of really neat um, costs versus benefits studies of different kinds of behavior. But one thing is an inappropriate attack. Well, that's costly. The stickleback can't be attacking everything that comes into the neighborhood. It's gonna to get too tired <laughs> and it will cost it its energy. But it turns out that red items are not very common in the environment. And so it's not like a lot of red things are going to come to its territory. So that, that is why the energy expended by the stickleback is not so great that it drains it of its energy. So it's an effective behavior. It is an effective behavior because excess energy is not expended on non-threatening stimuli, like differently colored fish. So a really interesting study is the control of behavior. How genes, innate behavior, instinctual behavior, controls the behavior or um, how learning controls behavior. So behavior that's developmentally fixed is called innate. It's under very strong genetic influence. 
and may be triggered by something environmental, but the behavior itself has a strong genetic component. It does not need to be practiced. Wouldn't that be great about ukulele? You just like play. <laughs> if only it were innate. <laughs> So heredity transmission of behavior can be very complex. It isn't completely straightforward. It's not, not generally Mendelian kinds of rules. The Mendelian rules of inheritance are such that there is uh, one dominant allele for a kind of behavior and one recessive allele. Um, so this might be the, the behavior, a dominant allele for the behavior of, say, a songbird call. That has, say, three tweets. And the recessive allele might be a songbird call of one tweet. So different kinds of behavior for different alleles. The trait is the songbird call. How do they find that out? Is it just by breeding, like experiments on breeding? That is a very good question. Yes, um, breeding. So how could you, oh, let's see. How could you tell whether a behavior was innate or not? How could you tell? What would you do as an experiment? I would breed. So if it's a songbird with three tweets, breed it with one that is like one tweet and see what if <laughs> what their children yeah. would be like. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you choose animals with certain behaviors and you breed them. It's really not that much different from Mendel's uh, pea experiments, you know, where he used plants. Uh, of course, the plants are a lot easier. So doing animal experiments uh, with behavior can take a long time because generation time can be quite long. But if you were to do uh, an behavioral experiments with animals, you would use things that had a short generation time. So that's a good point. You would use like, uh, uh, flies, fruit flies, very short generation time, a couple of weeks. Um, you could use also, there's another one that's used a little worm called C. elegans, C. elegans that's used for studies. You, usually they're morphological studies, but I uh, imagine they're, they're behavioral studies as well. Um, so this is an experiment of bees with bees. Some bees are hygienic. They uncap hive cells if a larvae is in there that has died to remove the rotting larvae. It's controlled by two genes, not just one. But if somebody is what's known as homozygous recessive, they will show the trait. That means that they have both recessive alleles. Uh, homozygous recessive. So they'll have the recessive alleles for uncapping, little u equals uncapping. It's really two behaviors, uncapping and removing. Um, little r is removing. So if the individual is homozygous recessive has both the recessive alleles, for both traits, they will exhibit uncapping and removing. And you can tell that with genetic experiments with bees, um, they're relatively easy to breed. So you would choose a homozygous hygienic uh, bee and a homozygous non-hygienic bee. You would breed them and get hybrids and then back cross with the hybrid bees and you would get a certain 
amount of individuals that are hygienic, um, non-hygienic, um, but they can remove larvae, you would get some that are non-hygienic, uncaps, but leaves the dead larvae inside, and you get some that are non-hygienic and doesn't uncap or remove. So those are the kinds of genetic experiments that are done with behaviors. Um, and the, the individual traits that they portray at the moment don't have to make sense. When we get into genetics and Mendelian genetics, we'll do crosses and we'll see exactly how um, test crossing works. But at the moment, we just want to know that you can do experiments with animals to determine genetic behaviors. This is an experiment with um, lovebirds. I don't know if it was done on purpose, but this is a peach-faced peach lovebird and a fisher's lovebird. And each species has their own method of carrying nest building material. So um, the fisher's lovebird carries a stick in its beak. The other one, the peach-faced one, carries a stick under its wing. So these are two quite different kinds of behavior for carrying twigs back to a nest. So they were bred, perhaps on purpose, probably on purpose, and there was a hybrid lovebird. So a hybrid is an individual that came from two different species breeding together. Another one that you'll know, you probably know about is a mule that comes from breeding a horse and a donkey. Then you get a mule. But in this case, you get this hybrid lovebird and, and the hybrids tried both, but they could do neither, um, they could do neither correctly. So that's not good news for the hybrid bird. That means that the hybrid probably won't survive well not being able to successfully build a nest. Learning is modifying behavior. And it's based on experiences in an individual's lifetime. A learned behaviors may be very simple, they may be very complex. Two kinds of learning have important outcomes. One is habituation. That's when a stimuli is presented over and over again, but it really doesn't have any useful information for that individual to respond to. So the individual gets habituated to it. In other words, uh, the part of the brain that, which is the thalamus that edits sensory information will stop sending that information to the cortex. Um, the signal will not be sent to the cortex of the brain. Once a signal is sent to the cortex, the brain goes, aha, uh -huh, I have to respond to this. But in this Case, the case of habituation, that doesn't occur. So let me ask you this. Are there any things to which you are habituated? We have senses, right? We sense our environment. What kinds of stimuli are you habituated to that you just don't simply don't respond to because you don't need to, there's no point. What do you think? Noise. So the, if you live noise? Mm -hmm. Noise. Like, yeah. if you, like I, I live near a hospital, but I don't really hear the sirens anymore. Yes, that is a very good example. Yeah, we used to live by railroad tracks, 40 feet away from the tracks. When somebody would come over and say, oh, that train is awfully loud and I'd go, what train? <laughs> right, so it's probably the same for you with the, with the ambulance. Yeah, any other examples? 
Um, I don't have like blackout blinds or anything and I'm on a pretty high floor. So I'm woken up by the sun usually early in the morning, but I would say it doesn't bother me nearly as much. Like I like recent now that I've gotten used to it. So like maybe like sunlight, I don't, I don't know, sometimes depending. Yeah, that is another good example. So uh, for Andrea, it's her hearing that's habituating. And for you, it's your vision that's habituating. Any other examples that you can think of? Anybody get habituated to smells? Um, I would say like when it was super smoky a couple weeks ago or whenever that was, like you don't notice the smoke until like you go somewhere that's even smokier. Like it kind of just gets, yeah. you kind of like level out to it. Yeah, yeah, that is a good point. Yeah, smell for humans actually uh, habituates quite quickly. Yeah, quite quickly. So the opposite of that is that if a noxious stimulus is applied, one to which the animal has to respond, like a toxin or something like that, the animal gets sensitized to it, becomes more sensitive to it. So I'm thinking, you know, I don't know about you, but something I'm more sensitized to these days is seeing people without masks, <laughs> you know? Like, if, of course, we would never have noticed something like that before. But we tend to notice that. Uh, yeah. So, imprinting is a kind of behavior. It includes both learning and innate components but it's generally irreversible. Here's Conrad again with his ducklings that imprinted on him. It's distinguished from other types of learning because there's a sensitive period, a limited phase in development. It's the only time when that behavior can be learned. If, if you miss a window, then basically the ducklings will, will wander around and they won't follow you or they won't follow the parent. So that does have, have to occur in a particular time period uh, early on in the animal's development with the ducklings. I'm not sure when it was, maybe even just like a couple of hours after hatching. I'm not really sure though exactly when the sensitive period is. Uh, these are young geese that are following their mother. So they imprinted on their mother. In this case, they, <laughs> they imprinted on Conrad Lorenz. So he went swimming and the geese followed him in the water. Oh, hang on, it said, it's right. Uh, the first few hours of their life, These look like older geese. So that kind of behavior lasts for a long time until the animal is independent. So this, the behavior is young geese follow an imprint on their mother. Let's ask the question, what is the proximal cause and what is the ultimate cause? So in this case, an early critical period, developmental stage, the geese observe the mother moving away from them and calling. So that's the trigger, the signal that the young geese need. The ultimate cause is that, of course, they follow the mother, they learn the skills required for survival, how to find food, for example, and they will have a higher survival rate. So the, the farthest I think this has been taken by biologists is a conservation biologist took advantage of that to save the whooping crane from extinction. So it turns out that the whooping crane was really low in numbers. And for whatever reason, uh, they were so low, the offspring couldn't find the way to um, fly in their migration path. So they made an ultralight that looked like a whooping crane. So instead of swimming in the water or um, walking on land, in this case, the birds fly and follow 
a particular, probably, parent. So the ultralight became the parent, and the whooping crane flew to its migratory and breeding destination. Uh, white crowned sparrows, so we have those around here, they learn a song by listening to their father. If a bird is raised in isolation, it will have an abnormal song. So getting back to Andrea's point early, how would you tell whether something is innate or not? Uh, you would have to isolate the offspring from the parents or from any kind of learning uh, environment. So if the bird hears a recording of the song during a very critical period, he will learn it, even a dialect. But he can only learn the song of his species. So if the bird hears the song of a different species, it won't learn that song. And it's probably because the vocal cords of the bird, which are not called a larynx, I think they're called a, fair, a syrinx, a syrinx, is just doesn't have the, um, the anatomy to do any song. Social behavior is very interesting. It includes interaction resulting from the response of one animal to another animal of the same species. So in this case, we've got the Serengeti, uh, we have zebras mixed in with other animals that are exhibiting herding behavior. which is very common in the animal world. What are the benefits? Well, uh, perhaps defense, both passive and active from predators. So the more animals together in one place, uh, the more likely they are to be stronger against a few or maybe one predator. Um, one of the main reasons is it's easier to find a mate. So we've asked that question about the heron colony that I'm pointing out here, it's right outside my window. The heron colony, why do, why do birds live in colonies? Well, during the mating season, it's way easier to find a mate if you're all together in the same place and not spread out all over. Um, so then one can synchro synchronize reproductive behavior that increases the likelihood of offspring survival. So in the case of lions, for example, uh, they breed together as a pride and females look after the other females brood while they go and hunt. So it's, it's conducive to hunting. And parental care, which is a kind of social behavior, increases the survival of offspring. Uh, so in this case, we've got a primate carrying another primate on its back, which is a very common behavior in primates. What are some disadvantages? Oh, wait, sorry, I've still got some advantages. Uh, selective consequences, benefits, cooperative hunting. Can you think of any incidences of cooperative hunting that you've seen? Uh, between different species or within the same, same species? species? Oh, yeah, dolphins. So dolphins. When, when they circle up and... Uh, one of them uh, shakes up the uh, silt yeah. and uh, the other ones are basically waiting for the fishes to fly out of the water and uh, eat them. Yeah, good. Yeah, it, uh, that's probably not the right word, <laughs> dislodges fish. Good, yeah. I'm huddling to avoid severe weather. Where have you seen instances of that? And there was a good movie <laughs> about that. It was the March of the... Penguins. Penguins. Very severe conditions in which penguins breed and, and lay eggs. And division of labor. The ants with the 
um, aphids. Did I pronounce that right? Aphids. Yeah. Aphids. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, well, uh, that would be a division of labor, but that's two different species. We should stick to the same species with social behavior. So right. that is a mutual behavior and, and it, it's definitely could be considered division of labor, but in this case, we'll think about the same species. I'm mm -hmm. racking my brain right now trying to think of one. <laughs> I think it's still ants because they, yeah. uh, some of oh, them are responsible for, sure. for the, the um, some of them are responsible for uh, basically cropping the leaves, so to speak. Some of them yeah, are responsible for, ants. right. Totally. Yeah, leaf cutter ants. Yeah, many colony insects, of course, yeah. Termites, bees. Great. There are some other consequences, learning new techniques. For example, this is a macaque, his name is Emo, who discovered on his own that if you wash the sweet potatoes, it would remove the sand. And then that behavior spread throughout the whole troop. Um, also, she found out, sorry, it's a female. She found out that if you threw wheat mixed with sand, so you, you don't wanna eat the sand, you just want the wheat. The sand would sink and then you could scoop up the wheat and eat that. And that behavior also spread throughout the troop. So that's another uh, selective consequence. Selective meaning that it contributes to survival. Disadvantages conclude, well, camouflage could be less effective. So if there's a whole bunch of individuals together, they may be quite a bit more noticeable than if they were on their own. And another disadvantage is there is more competition because food is usually limiting in different situations. So another really interesting question that um, it's a bit of a mind boggler really is the question of cooperation amongst individuals. So generally our fitness refers to our individual fitness. Uh, Richard Dawkins wrote a book called The Selfish Gene. So the propensity to get our genes into the next generation. So fitness and selection is about the individual. So why would you cooperate and, and help someone else to survive? So that is a big question. And of course, it's different for humans and other animals. Humans are in such large numbers, um, it's a necessity. There isn't enough land to support individual humans anymore, but um, it's an interesting question with animals too. Why would they? So a coordinated, coordinated behavior is when an individual adjusts its behavior when others are present. So that's agonistic behavior, fighting, uh, competition, because there's other animals present, change behavior to be more competitive and territoriality. And I, I'm not giving you too many examples because in the film we're about to watch, I'd like you to glean these examples out of the video itself. Cooperative behavior occurs when individuals perform activities that benefit others usually because it will ultimately be beneficial to the individual. So like cooperative foraging, for example, finding food is easier when there's more individuals looking and cooperative breeding behaviors, um, being in the same place and attracting females by say, like this happens with cicadas, all the males call at the same time. That makes the call really loud and so a lot of females come to that area. So that's cooperative breeding behaviors. So uh, when resources are limited, there's competition for things like food, water, mates, shelter. 
Aggressive or agonistic behavior includes a physical action or threat that causes another to abandon something. So ritualized threat displays uh, get the meaning crossed, interestingly, without injury. But the loser of a battle like that usually indicates submission, like you won, so that it doesn't get further injured. So there's a dominance hierarchy in some packs, for example, wolf packs, where there's a pecking order. It's called a pecking order because it was first observed in chickens. They were like alpha chickens. And of course, in, uh, we talked earlier about domestic dogs. The whole, I'll follow my master anywhere comes from the alpha behavior of the master. So that is, that is an innate quality that dogs have that they probably did inherit from wolves. A territory is an area from which others are excluded. And territoriality is observed when the individual defends that territory. It's usually a limited resource, like space or um, mates, food, There are two kinds, intraspecific, that's excluding members of the same species. So that's very common, particularly with birds, and interspecific, which excluding individuals uh, that might be after a resource regardless of species. That's interspecific territoriality. So, in the beginning of an establishment of territory, there can be more frequent aggressive encounters. Um, these are elephant seals, and sometimes they're, they're quite bloody battle between elephant seals in the beginning. Um, songbirds, they have it a bit more um, relaxed. <laughs> they use their song to establish their territory. And songs really are um, they're listened to, they're, they're followed by other birds. Other birds are quite aware when a bird with a specific song is keeping its territory to itself. Seabirds, they defend a small nesting site. So here's the site of a seabird. It's quite small, but they defend it. Um, others may defend foraging areas and those territories would be larger. Now there's a difference between uh, um, a territory and a range. So a range or a home range differs in that it's not defended, but it includes the total area an individual uses in its activities. So some may have very large home range like grizzlies, uh, but it might include a smaller defended territory, say, just the breeding area or the den in which the grizzly hibernates. Mating behavior is a product of a form of natural selection known as sexual selection. The mating relationship between males and females varies enormously between species to species, a very interesting field of study, mating behavior. But there are some systems that have been named um, um, mating may be promiscuous. There's no strong pair bonds or lasting relationships. So in promiscuity, like mallards, for example, mallards exhibit that. Um, the male is very showy. In monogamous relationships, however, uh, one male mates with one female. It may be for life. Or, as in the herons, it may be for a season. It may be fly or it may be for a season. 
In polygyny, one male mates with many females, and the males are often very showy. In polyandry, one female mates with many males. That is less common, uh, but the females may be more showy than the males. And a type of polygyny known as resource defense polygyny is where males gain access to females by holding critical resources. Uh, bullfrogs might hold, uh, for example, some area of water where there are plants onto which the eggs can be laid. Um, and I'm going to see when you watch the film if you can see some resource defense polygyny. There's also female defense polygyny. Females aggregate and can be defended by a male. That is the case with the elephant seals. Male dominance polygyny is when females select a male from an aggregation of males. And that aggregation is known as a lek, a communal display ground where males try to attract females. This is a sage gross, and there may be many of these in an area, and the females will have their pick. Um, inclusive fitness. Well, many social behaviors are selfish. Natural selection favors behavior that maximizes an individual's survival and reproduction. So altruism, it's difficult to, to understand why altruism would occur. Uh, but sometimes animals behave in a way that reduces their individual fitness, but increase the fitness of others. So that's known as altruism. Does that really occur or does it not? Well, this is a naked mole rat population. A non-reproductive individuals, they sacrifice their lives protecting the reproductive individuals from predators. This is an interesting colony that is not an insect, it's actually a mammal. So this behavior though can be explained by something known as inclusive fitness. The total effect an individual has on proliferating its genes by producing its own offspring, and this is very important, by providing aid that enables close relatives to produce offspring. And that is known as kin selection. So Hamilton proposed a quantitative measurement for predicting when natural selection would favor altruistic acts. There's three key variables. The benefit to the recipient of the behavior, the cost to the altruist, the one exhibiting the behavior, and the coefficient of relatedness just how closely related are you to that individual you're about to help? So the coefficient of relatedness is the probability that two relatives may share the same genes. So um, for example, this is parent A, this is parent B. Uh, parent B will, will donate this chromosome uh, parent A will donate either this one or this one. There's a 50% probability that the offspring will get one or the other. So you, for example, are 50% related to your, your siblings, but um, that's not to say you are exactly 50% related. Hey, you might have, have gotten way more of the same genes than 50%. So you may, if you, if you tend to look very much alike to your sibling, you've probably inherited more of the same genes uh, from either parent. So natural selection favors altruism when the benefit to the recipient multiplied by the coefficient of relationship exceeds the cost. So the equation is uh, little r b, is greater than C, then that, that um, behavior will be favored. Because that means that more of the individual's genes will probably be proliferated into the next generation, even if it's not from the individual. 
but it might be a relative of the individual. So kin selection is natural selection that favors altruistic behavior because it enhances reproductive success of relatives. So an example, for example, for example, for example, <laughs> the Belding ground squirrel. So the Belding ground squirrel, and this is actually more species uh, do this. The, um, the meerkat does this and a lot of birds do it as well. One individual will stand guard and warn when a predator is coming. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, that's not so great for the individual because if they're going, caw, caw, then that predator is gonna see them first. But they're willing to exhibit that behavior because they're protecting their kin. Another kind of altruism is known as reciprocal altruism. That is, sure, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. So um, I'm not sure of the vampire bat one, but there, there is one I remember. I think it was silverback gorillas, whereby one gorilla would assist a male gorilla in keeping away other males so they could mate and that behavior would be reciprocated in the future. Communication is really important in animal behavior. Um, it is the reception of and response to signals. Animals communicate in all kinds of different ways. Uh, they might use visual cues, it might be auditory, like the songbird. It might be chemical, like pheromones. It might be tactile, like scratching. It even may be electrical signals, like an electric eel, for example, or a shark. The type of signal is closely related to the animal's lifestyle and environment. The type of signal is going to be quite different from between uh, a watery existence and a land existence. Chemical contamination are things like pheromones. So this is one of the reasons why this moth has an enormous antennae, or two, and loads and loads of receptors. So here's one branch. These are all olfactory hairs and receptor cells. So the female silkworm um, produces an attractant, a pheromone, and that's picked up by the receptors in the antennae of the male moth. So the male moth finds it quite, quite easy to follow uh, a female moth by the pheromones. Have you ever noticed how uh, butterflies and moths, they don't fly very um, organized, in an organized way. They're kind of like, they look kind of spastic. They're flying all over the place all the time. And that's because they're testing the air. So they'll test the air for chemicals and they'll go to the highest concentration of chemical. But they still need to test the air when they get there. So they're constantly testing the air. Uh, this is an experiment done with uh, minnows. It also happens with catfish. They have an alarm substance, a chemical that they release into the water. And that causes a fright response. So all of the minnows, just within seconds of that chemical being released, all gather in one place to try and avoid the um, problem. I think honeybees is a really fascinating kind of um, communication. They have these different dances that they do in the hive. So a round dance conveys information about food that's close to the hive. And a waggle dance <laughs> indicates that food is farther from the hive. Uh, but the bee can use the position of the sun relative to the food source to indicate which direction the other bee should fly. So it's quite complicated. I'm not going to try and explain it in detail, um, but it's a very neat kind of communication behavior. Displays are a behavior that show, hmm, pick me as a mate, for example. This is the blue-footed booby. It shows its feet and its sky points. So sky pointing is quite a common behavior in birds to indicate their um, prowess or their health. Cognition is another kind of behavior. It's just like uh, any behavior of the nervous system and the brain. 
the ability to perceive, store, process, and use information. So all animals have a brain uh, of sorts or a nervous system of sorts, uh, except for the sponges, of course, they don't have a nervous system. But the hydra, even the simple animals have a neural net. So there's always some way of communication through uh, neurons. Um, things like problem solving can be learned by observing the behavior of other animals. This is a type of cognition. And I think that's all I have for this lecture. So thank you for watching. Uh, let me stop the recording.